Hello, everyone. Welcome to 2023, because it is. Um, so happy Christmas, New Year, all the other stuff, blah. Um, we're back. Um, we are back editing. So we're going to spend the next hour in that program, as I always point to. So Capture One. Capture One being the raw editing program that is made by the company Capture One um, out of Denmark. So in a place called Frederiksberg in Copenhagen. Um so we're going to, as I say, spend the next hour editing images and going through what can be done, what could be made better, uh, what can be made... Oh, audio is choppy. Sorry, people. What have we got? Let me just... Um, if that's true... How's that? Is that any better? Um, let me know. So what I was going to say, <laughs> funnily enough, is make these sessions as interactive as possible. Um, so please, in the comment section um, of this video, if you're watching live, put in any questions um, and hopefully we'll be able to um, answer them as we go. If the question is about something I'm doing on the screen, I'll try and pick it up at the time. Um, if it's not, um, we'll probably try and put it at the end or um, find an appropriate time to get it. So I'm not ignoring you um, if I... Um, I don't get to your question, but we will get there somewhere. Um, so everyone is now saying the audio is fine. So Paula, turn your speakers up. Um, so all good. Let's get started. Um, so in today's session, we are going to very briefly, very briefly cover the upcoming change that's happening at the end of this month. Um, and then we're going to get into the version um, that we're using and, uh, and start editing. So for those of you that have missed it, obviously, um, we covered it in the last section in detail. Not going to do that again this time, um, but there are some changes to perpetual licenses specifically. Um, so if you are a subscriber of Capture One, the changes that were announced last year that will come into effect from the 1st of February, so that's in a few weeks time, there is no change at all. Um, if you're a subscriber to Capture One, so that bit of software we're going to use, you always have access to the latest version every time, um, and there's no change to you for any of the announcements that are coming along um, in terms of restricting or or having any limit on what you can use and, and whatever else. Your life stays the same because um, you subscribe. If you are a perpetual license holder, and I'll put my Grover pointer up, as we introduced last time, um, if you are a perpetual uh, license holder, in September this year, your version will no longer get any new features. Um, so there are some changes that are coming out. There's some explanations that are going to come um, in presumably about a week or so's time. Um, so basically mid-January, Capture One have promised to detail what happens exactly to perpetual license holders and especially what happens when they want to upgrade. Because the difference is that the the old school way of doing it with upgrades and the old school way of, of sort of being able to just um, I guess skip a couple years um, and then upgrade may change. No one knows the detail of it yet, um, but that's it. Now, what happens after the 1st of February is you will be buying into a version that is feature locked. So if you previously had a feature, uh, a perpetual license for Capture One, already purchased before the 1st of February, you get feature updates up until that September cutoff. If you buy after the 1st of February, you don't get feature updates. Um, you get the version that you buy. Strange concept. You, you bought something, you get it. <laughs> um, but you do not get any feature updates. You do get bug updates. You do get bug support. But the feature updates are locked in the version that you buy. Now, more details of that are coming out, as I say, roughly next week. So they've promised two weeks before the 1st of February, so people have got time to digest the changes, make some decisions, um, and that's it. But as it stands right now, as I say, if you're a subscriber, no change. Um, you, you carry on downloading the latest version, and that's as it has always been for subscribers. If you're a perpetual license holder, look out for the announcement next week. That announcement will detail what's going to happen from the 1st of February in terms of I presume upgrade pricing. I don't know specifically, but upgrade pricing, what happens with bugs, what happens with features, and um, take it from there. So that aside, separate to that, and it is genuinely separate to that, we have Raphael, who is the CEO of Capture One on one of the unfiltered sessions that we're doing on the 2nd of February. 
Now, to calm any fears, because some people have mentioned this, the timing is down to me. It's nothing to do with Raphael. Raphael was happy to do it earlier, um, much earlier, but I'm not physically here to do it. So the 2nd of February is my driving date, not Raphael's. Um, but we will be talking to Raphael live um, as a sort of Ask Me Anything or Q&A session. Um, if you want to get a question in advance, because we're compiling some of them, um, then use th that email, um, live at paulreefer.com. Send in your questions um, to Raphael. We'll try and group them if we can, um, but get as many of those done as possible in that session. If you're joining live, then you're welcome to ask questions at the time. We'll try and get through as many as we can there too. But Raphael has opened his um, diary and, and offered his time to talk frankly um, and robustly um, about everything from company to culture to development to plans to roadmaps to his own photos um, that you, you can have a look at um, and the teams and stuff like that. So we'll cover that uh, for an hour on the 2nd of February. You're all welcome. Everyone is welcome. Um, open house. Uh, but that's happening then. It is not, I repeat, not timed or coinciding with any license change or anything like that it's just happened that that's the timing and i'm sure we will cover some of the license changes in the discussion but it's not about that so that's our sort of intro stuff i guess um so license changes coming up keep an eye out in your inbox if you have a perpetual license next week um, because the announcement is due from capture one on what's going to happen in the future until that point i would you know as paul has just said um, I would just hold off. Um, so I know lots of people are, are anxious and lots of people are, are, are excited slash concerned about what's going to come out in, in that announcement. Um, whatever it is, I don't know what's in there. No one else knows what's in there. Um, but next week, hopefully, everything's a little bit clearer and then we can all make decisions that make sense for us. Cool. Um, but then obviously following that, you are all welcome to come and ask Raphael lots of questions about hopefully the future and this tool um, the tool that we're going to go into so we are on capture one version 23 or as it's marketed 23 because it's the year 2023 the actual version number the software number is 16.0.1 um, that's the current latest version if you're not on that version and you own version 23 as a perpetual license then upgrade get the latest version it's got all the bug fixes in if you are a subscriber, then go into your account and download the latest version, please, because it's got all the bug fixes and all the changes in. If you're on a previous version, if you're on Capture One 22 or 21, you'll be able to follow along with most things I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a caveat at the beginning on one item. Um, but yes, you can follow along, but you also have the choice. Go into your account. You can choose to upgrade or not. And bear in mind that deadline, 1st of February deadline. So if you are thinking of upgrading, Hold off, have a look at your email next week from the facts that are given from Capture One rather than all the subjection and everything else like that. Um, take those facts, work out how they apply to you and then make a decision after you've got that information as to whether you want to upgrade before the 1st of February. After the 1st of February, not at all, or subscribe. Those are kind of the four options. So 16.0.1, uh, let's load up Capture One. So here is our interface. Um, new year, new people, I guess, to a certain extent. We're going to cover a couple of basic things that, that people really miss, actually, when they first go into Capture One. The first is everything in here is customizable. Um, so and I'm not going to go into exactly how to set up your workspace, but if you right-click up here and go to Customize Toolbar, you can choose to put the things that you need up here. So I always have my proofing icon up there so I can choose to have proof or not on the display. An exposure warning, very rarely used, but it is handy for just checking if there's any clipping. You just get rid of the customized thing. Guides, because they're really handy for horizons. Oh my, over Christmas, the number of things I saw on Facebook with wonky horizons. Please, if we're gonna take pictures of the sea, can we please keep it level? The sea doesn't do that, it does that. Um, it does do that if you're surfing, but it generally does that if you're looking out photographically. Um, so use guides to do that. And the guides are movable. We can, uh, let me just switch to my uh, mouse pointer so we can move them up and down. We can even add new guides. So if I go to view, customize guides, and I can add new ones as well. But having the little on off button up here, kind of useful. There is a shortcut key. If I move my mouse over any of these, it will also give me a little tool tip for it. 
Edit selected is typically used because if I want to change more than one thing or paste some settings to more than one picture, I need to turn that on. If I have this off, it will only apply changes to the one that's got the bold outline around the picture. Before and after, really useful, kind of self-explanatory, but you can press Y on your keyboard, um, but you can see what's happened before, what happened after your changes. Uh, grid, and for people that don't like this grid, you can go into, and it's actually, um, the these tabs were changed, obviously in version 23, I think, was it 22? Can't remember, got news to them now. Um, but under grid, you can choose your grid type. So not only can you choose how many sections the grid is in, this is handy for the rule of third stuff, but you can also have a golden ratio, which is perceived to be a softer way of, of achieving your, your um, rule of thirds and harmony in your picture. Or you can have the Fibonacci spiral that no one really gets, but looks kind of cool on the screen. Um, there is actually some logic to it, but we're not going to go into that in this session. So grid up there, you can turn on or off the link to the YouTube channel and you've got your copy and apply. If you want more tools or you want less tools or some of these are missing, right click on the toolbar, drag the ones that you want up and down, um, and you can customize your workspace. If I don't want my browser, so my list of images on the right hand side, view, customize browser, and I can say place below, and it puts it along the bottom. Personally, I prefer having my browser on the right hand side, and of course there are keyboard shortcuts to do it as well. And all of that applies onto these. So if I want new tool tabs, I can add them. If I want to add a new tool, to any of my tabs, I can do that through Capture One. And when I've done it, go to Window, go to Workspace, and save your workspace. Capture One helps everyone a lot by backing up your workspace. So whenever you do an upgrade to a new version and everything's changed, and I see, I see people complain, everything's changed, what's happened to my workspace? Capture One has backed it up. Don't worry, but don't rely on it either. Backups don't always work. So I have in here my backups from, where are we, seven, eight? I uh, don't know where nine went, but 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, and I've also got customized workspaces. We've also got the standard ones for you know splitting monitors and stuff like that. But if you save your workspace, you can keep that workspace updated as the versions go along. And you can pick up that workspace and you can move it as well to other um, machines. So. To me, this is one of the most powerful parts of Capture One is the customization. So when you first load up Capture One, fine, go with the defaults. But as you start to use it, as you start to work out your workflow, not the developer's workflow, and as you start to customize these tabs and change the way that the tools look, save your workspace, please. That's the most powerful thing you can do to make sure that your workspace is always yours and it doesn't ever risk um, changing back to default. Okay, so that's our, ta-da, we're into Capture One. Next up, we're going to cover styles very briefly, I think. Um, but please, if people have got questions on styles, we'll go into them here. Um, because the, oh, sorry, I missed that. Tim, can you please say a word about copy and apply, the double arrow? Seems that nobody else but me finds it useful. Okay, so if you're copying settings, so let me um, let me just clone this variant a couple times. So let's make this variant really, really weird. Okay, and for whatever reason, in fact, let's uh, clone that one as well. For whatever reason, I want to make this one look like this one. Well, I've got my co oops, sorry, move the window, make everyone feel a little bit weird. Um, I've got my copy arrow up here, so I've copied everything from the clipboard. I can go down to my second picture and I can apply. And I can also choose which um, copy and apply adjustments I'm going to um, apply through the menu system. But more importantly, this is a very quick way of doing it. There is a quicker way, and maybe, Tim, this is why um, some people don't use it, because I can also do it through shortcut keys. So if I reset this, go to this one, Command or Control, Shift and C, copies from there, Command or Control, Shift and V, paste to there. So while these buttons are really useful, the copy and apply buttons, um, I tend to not use the buttons because I'm quicker just using the keyboard. It's a personal choice, but that's what that is doing. Um, and you can literally take from one image, um, put to the other, and it takes all the adjustments. Bear in mind, it takes literal adjustments. So for instance, in here you saw I shifted the white balance down to 1024 minus 27. 
that was by quite a lot from 2523. So what did I move it down? Minus roughly 1400, let's call it that. This one has gone to 1074 minus 27. It hasn't shifted it by 1400. Oh, sorry. It hasn't shifted it by 1400 from its original. It's taken the literal values. So do be careful when you're doing copy and apply um, because it's going to take exactly what you did from image one and apply it onto the image two. So funnily enough, we're going to talk about white balance now on, on styles. So, but good point. Um, the copy and apply buttons up there, really, really useful. There are also shortcut keys. Um, so consider using those, but as it stands, um, for those that want to use um, the buttons, great, um, go for it. Remember as well, they work in tandem with edit selected. So if I want to apply to a load of images that I've selected, I need this enabled. If I have that disabled, it will only apply to the one that's got the bold white outline around it, regardless of how many are, are selected. Okay, um, so styles. Uh, the question came up over between Christmas, New Year, whatever it was, um, about what's the order that you should consider applying styles um, in terms of do you do a style first and then make edited changes or do you do all your changes first and then apply a style? And my answer was, was it depends, which is often the answer, unfortunately. Um, but I'm going to show you some of the reasons why you might want to do a base edit before you apply styles. Um, God, uh, can you export the workspace settings to have them the same as the second computer? Yes, you can by copying preferences across. I'm not going to do it on the screen right now, but I'll probably put in the comments. Um, there are paths to copy your settings um, effectively, and you can pick up um, those settings and you can place them across. Um, same with styles. You can you can literally copy your styles from one computer to the other. Um, and, and yeah, all good. Um, okay, so in this image here, I'm going to pick on a style that we created called Blockbuster. So we have a pack called Elevation, which is a load of styles um, that you can use or not use, up to you. Um, but in there, we've got cities and landscape styles. And these styles are designed to give a certain feel so, you know, we've got ones that accentuate blues and reds. We've got ones that make things very, very vibrant and very vivid. Um, we've got ones that mute. Um, and in this case, the one that, that we're going to talk about is Blockbuster. So Blockbuster is designed for that orange and teal effect. The orange and teal effect um, is a look that works on, um, on, on Instagram quite a lot, to be honest. Um, but it basically mutes all colors and it presents effectively highlights as very orange and anything close to orange it sort of squashes into being orange and the reverse so shadows become this sort of teal color and anything near to blue or teal becomes really really teal so you can see uh, before after or i can apply that style so if i do my before after or my y key on the keyboard great i've got my before and i've got my after and i can see what's happened what's changed so we've got a bit of dehaze and stuff like that I mentioned version 23 has a change, which 22, 21, and 20 won't um, see, which is when I apply styles that have been written for version 23, they now apply as layers and potentially multiple layers. So before, styles used to default to apply to the background, and if it did apply to a layer, it could only be on one layer. As of 23, exciting. You can apply styles across multiple layers, whether that's one that you've purchased or whether you've made it yourself but it gives you independent control of the opacity of those layers and the effects. So if I look at this style, we can see there's two layers on here. So the first is a base cooling layer. So drops everything down, cools it. Um, that's set at 50%. We can obviously reduce that effect or we can increase that effect. It becomes more teal, so to speak. And then on top of that, we've got a warm accent layer. So if I click this one, turn it on. That's the one that makes all the yellows and oranges pop and become more orange. And again, same thing. As of version 23, we can reduce the opacity of that effect or we can increase it. Great. So in version 22 and before, the version, um, that for those of you that are on that version, if you use, for instance, the style pack here, the elevation one, the the style that we created for Blockbuster only has one layer. You don't have this inter or independent control of the two different color styles. Um, as of version 23 and beyond, you get all these extra um, versions. 
So this is fine because my base edit was pretty much all set. My white balance was good. The exposure is okay. If I look at this histogram, one of the most useful things, if you don't have histogram on every one of your tabs, please add it. It's the most useful thing to have at the top and layers. Um, but I couldn't have exposed this really any differently. You know, the highlights are right up there at the top. The shadows are right down there at the bottom. We're limited in what we can push to the right or left. So the, the ability for me to make many changes in terms of exposure on this one are quite limited. It's not really a filter shot because we've got highlights all over the place. There's no filter that's going to match every single highlight. Um, so our exposure is fine. Our white balance is fine. If I were to go to an auto white balance, let's just clone this variant and reset it. So let's go to an auto white balance. It's actually warming it up beyond what it should really be. Um, so to me, that was what was there at the time. I'm going to stick with that. That was what the camera saw. Um, so our white balance is pretty much on. Our exposure is on, which means when I put a style over the top, I'm starting from a good place and the style is adding a feel to the image. It's not correcting anything, it's not fixing anything. So let's take this one. I'm going to apply the same style. So this was what we're we on, Blockbuster 2. So let's go to our Styles tab, Blockbuster 2, and apply it. Well, what happened? So let's do before and after. Well, it's had a change but not much has actually applied. It's certainly not gone blue. There's no real teal in it and the orange hasn't really popped. And the reason why in this case, and it'll depend on your, your own photo, but the reason is that we don't have our white balance set correctly at the time of shoot or before I tried to apply that camera. Oh, sorry, apply that, um, that style. So let's just reset this. So let's get rid of my before and after. Um, Let's just go to our shot. Yeah, so it was shot way too warm. Don't know why. Weird, weird thing. If I go to auto, it's probably getting it about right. That was probably about the right tone for that scene. So we've now got these are looking a lot more gray, like they were. Uh, the railroad tracks are no longer bright orange. You know, we've got buildings that are a bit more um, relaxed. Let's call it that. Um, so. All of these things have just calmed down purely through a white balance adjustment. So let's just reset this and I'm going to clone the variant. And on this one, we're going to apply Blockbuster 2. And on this one, we're going to fix our white balance first and apply Blockbuster 2. And look at the difference between them. So Yes, the style will take over the image and it will have an effect on the way that the image looks, but it's only able to go from the base point that you gave it. And if our base point is wrong, especially with white balance, and white balance is one of the critical things when you're using styles that affect color, if that base point is wrong, you end up with a, a version of that style which really didn't start from a good place. You need to get your base version of the image looking good first. There are other things as well to consider. So, for instance, this style here, Blockbuster 2, is actually designed to cut highlights. So if I just reset this, so let's look out here into these highlights here. So the default version has no effect on it. The highlight reduction one actually tries to get back detail in the lights trails, the, the strands, the, the, the little pinwheels that are coming out of individual lights. All those specular highlights are being reduced as a result of using the highlight reduction version of that style. So we go from there to there. If I wanted shadows to increase, I'd use the shadows lift version. And if I want to use both, so highlights and shadows, we go to max range and that gets basically an HDR effect. Now, the problem is, of course, this can only recover so much. So if, again, and I'll go back to it, if I start from a histogram that has problems, way overexposed, way underexposed, whatever, the style will try its best, and depending on the style pack that you've, you've purchased, they may or may not have those options. But if you've got one that has highlight recovery, it can only recover so much. It can't recover something that's five stops overexposed. 
So just again, bear in mind, before you're applying a style for a specific look, fix your white balance on the background layer. Make sure your exposure is looking good as a good starting point. It's the standard stuff for editing, really. And then apply your styles. The thing that I see most often is people start from a bad base. And I don't mean it's a bad photograph. I mean, there's something in the base that isn't neutral. The, the white balance is off. The highlights are too overdone or whatever. And then they start going through the styles and trying to work out which ones work with it. Well, you're making a decision based on a, a falsehood because we don't know what it will really look like. This one is Hot Rod. If I go back to the original and reset that white balance, these two are using the same style, but they're completely different images as a result purely of that white balance on the bakes or the background um, of the image. Um, or one question from Suzanne. Uh, Catch one twenty two worked on a MacBook Pro twenty thirteen. Blimey! Um, recent upgrade to M one and Teletool Go. We can't connect camera to capture one. Um, I haven't heard of it being a software challenge. And the R six I think was out when version twenty two was around for sure. Actually. Um, so I'm surprised. Um, I would check whether you're on the latest version of 22, which is version 15. Um, it can be the cable. So we've seen quite a lot of things online about people complaining about, you know, X type of cable or Y type of cable. And, and what's funny is laptop manufacturers will always say it's not the laptop. The cable guys will always say it's not the cable. The software guys will always say it's not the software. I would say in that setup, your camera will work on Capture One 22. Um, it's able to use those, um, it's able to import those files. Um, if you've switched up to a different MacBook, it may be down to the protocol, maybe. I'm not sure that the M1s are, are talking to your camera with. I'm not sure. Um, but I would try a different cable to start with. Um, try a different, well, if you can, try um, a, a different such someone else's laptop um, just to see. You know, put a trial version of Capture One on just to see. Um, and then potentially put a trial version of 23 on, see if something changed maybe with the M1 setup that they've had to fix in a later version of Capture One. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, um, you're going to have to, unfortunately, you're going to have to do a bit of um, piece by piece investigation. So swap the cable out. Um, and I know, so it isn't the cable. I hear that so many times and then it turns out it's the cable. Um, so cables break sometimes randomly. I've had it with an Ethernet cable um, a couple of months back. Um, and I said the same. It's not the cable because it was working last week. Yeah, but it's not working now. Um, I may have run over it with a chair. I don't know. Um, but, you know, check the cable, yes. But also try um, a trial version of Capture One to see if something changed in the software. Try a different laptop just to see whether it's the physical hardware in the laptop. It could be a port. If you're running it through a hub um, on an M1, I wouldn't. I would put it straight into a USB-C if you can. But there's a few things to try, but you're going to have to do them quite logically and methodically. So for style, um, and, and this applies whether you're using a purchase style um, or someone um, has created one for you or you've created your own, remember that when you create it as well as when you use it, do it from a good base. There's no point in creating a style from a picture that wasn't in a good place to start with because if you try and apply that to another picture, unless that picture had the same problems, it's not going to look the same. So um, you can see if it's you know, in the right place to start with, you get the right result. If it's in the wrong place to start with, you get the wrong result. So change that base point and then play with style. Um, and then it comes on to the question of, you know, which you know, what's better to do a style first and then edit or edit and then, then do a style. Um, it depends. And what, I, what my stance has always been is if I want the picture to be predominantly about the style, then genuinely get the base edits done and then apply the style and tweak. If it's predominantly about using the style to do some base edits and then you want to take it further from there, then apply the style first and then do all your editing from that point. What I wouldn't do is get caught in the seesaw trap. Um, which, and what I mean by that is people put a style on, they'll then edit to try and fix something that's in the style because they don't like a particular element. That doesn't work, so they try a different style. That changes some other things, so they then edit some more. 
it goes backwards and forwards and you end up in a place where it's a bit of a mess at the end. So let's take an example here, which is I'm going to add on to here Golden Hour. Um, so we've got a landscape style called Golden Hour. And I've got, again, four options. So I'm going to take this base edit. I'm not going to change a thing. This is out of camera. And we're going to apply, that's our default. Highlight reduction, it's looking pretty good. Shadows, ooh, too much. We've pulled up too much, it's gone HDR. A max range, well, it's still pulled up too much. So we're going to do a highlights reduction one. So with that done, I've now got a picture, which if I go before and after, has got a certain bias towards looking like golden hour. So all the oranges and reds and yellows have been enriched, but it's also had an effect on other things like this grass down here. Some of this has turned a little too warm for my liking, for example. So the easy thing to do, or the, the quickest thing to do that we'd think of is go to a color editor. So either scroll down on your adjustments tab by default and you'll get to your color editor, even in basic. Or if you've added the color tab up here, then to add a tab up here, add tool tabs. If you've got any missing, then do that. If, by the way, this looks like you can't fit all your tabs, it's probably because you've got icons and text on there, so they become very big. If you turn it on to icons only and can remember what they mean, and you're going to get a lot more tabs in. So on our color editor, let's just do the picker and say, right, it's this color here. Great, let's pick that out. And I want to shift the hue to stop being quite so orange and be a bit more green like it was before. Great, but look at what's happened up here. So without that, I've got a warm glow from the cloud from the sunrise off on the right hand side. With it, I've now got green clouds or yellowy green clouds. Doesn't really make sense. And what happens is people say, oh, the style has ruined my picture. No, the edits that we've done since that style have, and actually the style can, as we say, have an adverse effect on your picture. But if it has, it's probably because one of your base edits was wrong or you don't like the style, which is also okay. Some, some, some styles don't work for some people and that's fine. But just be really careful with this. By fixing one part of that style, I've created a problem somewhere else. So if you're going to get into using styles and your own or, or whatever, let's just reset that. Try not to do anything on the background layer if you're trying to fix or alter something that the style has done. So in this case, our style has made this grass too warm, but everything else I'm fine with. Easy. New layer. Call it grass. Because there's only really this bit that is that color, I could just do it as a, as a blanket paint, but let's just use magic brush because we've got it. Um, let's go to a relatively big star, a big uh, size. I'm just going to paint, let Capture One work out what should be included in that mask. Now, here's a fun one. Because this is mossy and rocky, the magic brush kind of struggles to work out what should be included. So I'm just going to paint lots of times with Magic Brush. And it's done a good job, but you can see it's missing stuff. And if I really want to work out what those things um, are, are that are missing, if I press down the Option key or the Alt key and press M for Mask, or up here, I can say Normal M, Always Display, or Never Display, that's on or off. And you can see here this Option M or Alt M is Display the Grayscale Mask. Now with a grayscale mask, I can think about trying to expand or refine, that's the keyword, the area that I've already got clicked. I could fill this in, but it might make some, some issues in there. So I'm gonna right click on our mask, <clears throat> go to refine. And what refine allows me to do, I'm gonna actually push it pretty high, is effectively soften the context that the mask is looking at. So it's gonna spread, it's gonna fill the gaps, but it's also going to go to the edges and it's going to make it a smoother mask that's less obvious to the eye when we're looking at it. Now with that mask, having refined it, we can go into our, in fact, we just do it again. So down here, that's picked up that yellow again. I can shift that hue to be more green. Don't do it too much, please. Let's not do this because that doesn't make sense. If the light was golden, it can't be that it was that color. But what we can do is shift it a little bit 
um, and probably actually pull down the lightness just a touch. I don't want this to be the subject. I want this to be the subject out here. So overall, with this section, I could go into my Adjust tab and actually pull down exposure of that foreground. That would work too. Now I'm going to make a filled layer. And that filled layer is going to be global adjustments. And notice we're not doing this on the background layer. Why? <clears throat> because the background layer is then affected by our style layers that are on top. This allows me just a bit more logical control in my head about how much I'm changing globally on top of everything that's been done. And I can always back it away, which I can't do on the background. So in here, I'm going to pull up our shadows like that. Not too much, maybe there, a tiny bit of black. And then back with our grass layer, this foreground here, I'm going to pull that exposure down more. So now I've made the subject more about this part in the middle. We could actually use a typical sort of classic vignette like this. Great. And that sort of does it. So we go from there to there using a style, but fixing something that the style had a detrimental effect on without throwing the style out. Because um, I see this is almost like a, if it doesn't happen with one click, <laughs> then this, we'll throw that out and start again. Don't need to, just just tiny little um, changes. Um, yeah. Uh, Brian, to your question, I think Prasad's probably covered it, but um, the tolerance slider is basically, Magic Brush is looking at similarity of pixels around it. Um, or across the image, if you disable, um, so on your Magic Brush, you've got this option here, which is sample entire photo. If you had to sample entire photo and I click on an area, which is say yellow, it's going to look for the entire image for something that is similar to that pixel or that, that color. Now that doesn't just mean it's purely yellow, but it's also looking for how bright and dark it is, for example. Now the higher up the tolerance, the more free reign you're giving it. The lower down the tolerance, the more specific it's got to match before it gets included. So if you're not sampling the entire photo, not only does it have to be very, very close, if your tolerance is low, it has to be very, very close in look, but it's also got to be a neighboring area. If you've got a sample entire photo, then it can be across the whole image, and your tolerance controls how similar to the area that you've clicked the that pixel has to be to be included in the mask. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, yell. Okay. Um, so that's it with styles. And, and this is why I'm saying when someone says, what order should I do them in? Should I do my own edits first and then styles or styles, then my own edit? The answer is it depends on what your priority is, whether you're looking for that style to be the thing that you see or whether you're looking to use the style to get to a base point and then make your own um, look out of something. And there's no right answer on those. Um, Jeff, vignetting on the grass layer, shouldn't it be in the background layer? Here's a fun one. The vignette tool applies on the background layer regardless. It doesn't matter which layer I click on, the vignette tool is global. Same with the black and white tool. So if I, you know, I happen to be on the grass layer when I went down to vignette, but it doesn't make a difference. If I make this 0.53, go to my background layer, it still stays or stays as 0.53 because the vignette tool and the black and white uh, conversion tool are global tools. They apply across the whole image. Um, so if that's it, um, so if everyone sort of makes sense in their heads as to, to why there isn't necessarily a strict order, but more importantly, um, how to look at the layering of styles and what comes first and what comes second, then great, we, we'll move on. Um, but the key thing is get your base edit right. Get that neutral, get it exposed correctly or moved correctly into your exposure within your histogram, and then move across to styles from there to see what the style is going to do. Don't start from a bad place and then think that the styles aren't doing what you want. Okay, um, let's just shift across to an image from Ray. Um, now, before anyone says anything, Ray's own words were, I'm not sure anything in this photo is in focus apart from, I think he said maybe something on the counter or a light bulb. Um, I agree, Ray, there is very little in this image that's actually in focus. It's actually almost this guy, but it's kind of, I think maybe the thread on this guy's hoodie um, that you've got in focus. So 
<clears throat> can capture one fix that no it can't um, and we're not going to try to in this and that wasn't ray's question um <clears throat> excuse me so just to show you what can be done because i do get asked this quite a lot in capture one can you effectively recover stuff that's out of um, sharpness and out of focus you can ish but be really careful with it the one to stay away from is actually noise reduction if you try and push your noise reduction all the way up um you're not really going to get oh, sorry my noise reduction why am i saying noise reduction sharpening tool if you try and push your sharpening tool all the way up um you will get a result um so a low threshold let it have free reign, really wide radius. Let it push it all the way up to, oh, sorry, let's go to a thousand. So do we have a sharpening effect? Yeah, we do. Um, this guy has become really quite sharp, actually. It's done a pretty good job with him. Better than I thought, to be fair. Um, the hoodie? Absolutely. I think that was the bit that was in focus. Um, this guy here is okay. You know, even the stuff on the bar done a pretty good job here but what i'm also seeing especially with areas that have got bokeh is halos around things artifacts a lot of noise being brought up you know there's, there's loads of stuff that is a problem by over sharpening your image so can you recover it yes but just think about what your the actual result's going to be there is another way of doing it um a little more carefully which is by using your clarity tool and using a little bit of clarity and a lot of structure. So structure gives us a sharpening effect. So again, I'll just show you before and after. So from there to there, it's not quite so brutal, not quite so harsh. Um, it seems a bit more natural. And what you'll find is you've got a lot less of an issue around bokeh. It keeps bokeh. You don't get quite the same halos. Um, so all of that stuff, um, it, it has a bit of a benefit for. So structure is kinder to trying to do this stuff. A mix of structure and a bit of style, plus a bit of sharpening. Oh, God, got style on my head now. Um, with a very low threshold is probably the right sort of combination. That's going to get you something that's a little bit better, but it's not pushing it too far. So don't whack all these sliders up equally. Don't whack these sliders all the way up. Use a combination of the two and you'll get to something that looks a bit sharper than it was before. It is not going to fix an out of focus image. Now, the, the more important question, I guess, from Ray, um, which was there, um, is what would we do to this from a style point of view? Because actually, it's a nice shot. It's got a, it's got a nice feel to it. It's got a nice, you know, it's taken in a bar from a bar top and whatever. Um, you know, can we do something with it? And there are a couple of things that I'm looking at which are probably distracting. So number one, what's our subject? Let's assume that we've got sharpness around here. Is it him? Should it be him? Should it be these bottles and bar? I don't know. Um, but whatever our subject is, typically you'd go for the sharpest point. So in this case, we're going to go with him, rightly or wrongly. Which means this thing here, this thing, this hoodie here on this human, um, is a bit distracting. Now, I don't want to remove them because they're part of the picture, and I, I, there's no way I can guess what should be behind them to reconstruct it. But I do want to reduce the impact of that person in the shot. So we're going to create a new layer, person, and I'm going to show you to Brian's point. So if I put my tolerance right the way down to one and click here, it's got that. If I put my tolerance all the way up to 100 and click here, it's got that. That's what we mean by how similar an area needs to be. And now you'll notice that on here, it's not sample entire photo. So it's only looking for things that are connected some way. But because of this color here, if you think about it, this color is very similar to this color here. Not the rest of the hoodie, but it is there and this up here and this in here. So quite rightly, when I click on our magic brush, it's going to capture, sorry, let's turn that on, all the things that it thinks are similar. So when we, when we think about how we're going to select this person, don't automatically think magic brush, don't automatically think auto brush and whatever else. There are other ways of, of collecting him, but magic brush is a good place to start. 
let's just undo that um Andreas, in terms of styles, just specifically on your question, um, how do you get the latest version? You just go into your account. So in your account in Capture One, so when we moved everyone to 23, um, I and other people, um, we, we re-engineered all the styles. In fact, in 23, we added styles in um, for free. So anyone that owned the styles before, if you go into your account and re-download the styles, you'll find the version 23 versions of those styles. They're downloadable for free for you because you already own it. So Magic Brush. Let's increase our tolerance. So by the way, if you don't want to right click on an image up here, and because for some reason I can't do that, <laughs> my computer's playing up. If I go to settings up here, I can go to the magic brush settings and say my tolerance, I want it to be quite low. Don't sample the entire photo, but let's just try and grab that hoodie. And I'm gonna click a few areas. So magic brush, as I say, it's a good place to start. It's not the be-all and end-all, it doesn't fix every problem, but you can see here, it's done a pretty good job. Now I do want this edge to be a bit softer. So let's think about what I did earlier. Let's go to my um, grayscale mask, it's quite harsh here. So let's just go to right click, refine mask. And we can see here it's softened. So if I go to zero without any refining, that was what Magic Brush picked up. I want to soften this all the way until I can see that it's starting to get the bokeh and it's starting to get all of that fall off of focus on the edges. So about there. Don't want to push it too far because you can see, hopefully, um, out there that it's started to get this bit here. I didn't put the grayscale mask on, but there, this isn't included. Here, you see this is starting to go red. We don't want to get bits of the outside of this person, so let's go to about there. If I go to the grayscale mask, we can see what that's done. If I want to remove bits, of course I can go to the eraser. You know, just because you've used Magic Brush doesn't mean that you can't use the eraser afterwards. So let's just do that, that, let's just get rid of this very quickly. Don't have to be too careful because of what we're about to do with them. Right, turn my mask off and all we're going to do is just pull down that exposure a little bit. Um, and probably actually pull down contrast a touch as well. Now, that just makes them less obvious. We now need to focus um, our viewer over here instead. So yes, we could use a classic vignette. So going back to the um, the, the scenario we were at, and by the way, Ray's done, um, there were a couple of things. I think you changed a crop or something like that in there. I, I can't remember, something like that. Um, now, if I do use a classic vignette, so we're like what we did just now. Great, we've gotten rid of this person some more. We're focusing on here, we've gotten rid of here, gotten rid of here, but we've also lost this sign, and that's a bit of a shame. So unless you want a vignette which is you know elliptic or circular, and those are the choices, um, this is quite a blunt tool. Instead, think about adding a new layer, and think about using your radial mask. So we're just going to turn the mask on, and we're going to go like that. I'm going to move this middle circle to be more circular. Oh, sorry, more in the middle, so smaller. The bigger the distance between this dot here, which is the 0% point, and this um, line out here, which is the 100% point. So in other words, anything this side of the mask is 100% applied. Anything this side of the mask is 0% applied, and it slowly falls off through 50. That's why we're moving this, because the closer these get, the more obvious that line becomes. The further away they are, the less obvious it is that I've used a mask on it. So we're going to go over this person here. That creates me my vignette. Great. And let's just do a you know, typical vignette, which is basically pull down that exposure. Great. But I've still got this up here. So what am I going to do? Really simple. Right click. Oops, sorry. I'm going to right click on here and go to rasterize mask. Or I'm going to go to the erase tool, which is going to do it for me. Because as I click here and make my brush nice and big and soft, click once on any either radial or linear mask, and it's going to say, do you want to rasterize the mask? What it means by that is we're going to stop it being a radial mask that I can edit. So I need to make sure I've got it in the right place before I do this. But when I click rasterize, I can now erase bits. And if I look at what I did, I'm going to pull down that opacity down to about 50 so I can be a bit softer with the effect because I want this to appear up here 
want a bit of this guy here, and I want to leave the rest of the vignette there. If I did, uh, in fact, let's do it, the grayscale look. We can see that mask now. That's not a vignette. <laughs> the vignette is a perfect ellipse or, or circle. So the second you want to go away from the perfect sort of four corner um, um, call of a vignette, you need to use your radial mask and then use the eraser or, or the brush if you want to add to it, but one way or another, just to make sure that you're getting all the other bits. If I, let's say I do want a bit of fall off up here, then let's go to our brush because now it's rasterized. Of course, I can add to it as well. So let's put a really low flow brush in there, up there, and we're just going to paint that in just, just to knock out that really bright bit up there. And that's it. So that gives us a feel. Now, if I wanted to sort of stylize this, we can go into our color editor. So either scroll down your adjust tab, which is the one with all the sliders, or go to your color editor tab. And we're going to go into our color balance tool. So a lot of you know that we use this quite a lot. Um, white balance allows us to warm it up and cool it down. And I think, um, yeah, Ray's, Ray, Ray's online. Hi, Ray. Um, so a bit of crop and a bit of white balance and some rotation. Yeah. So we're going to go a bit further than that. And the reason is that white balance is that global shift. Um, so let me just call this one vignette. And I'm going to then create a new filled layer and go to color grade. So white balance will shift the entire feel to be cooler, warmer, you know, somewhere in between, whatever. Um, oop, didn't want to reset that. Um, let's just reset that to where it was. Okay. Now white balance being that global adjustment means that, yes, we might get the highlights to be warmer, but it also warms up the shadows or it also changes the midtones. The color balance tool, so this is the standard master one, but the three-way one is really valuable allows us to say, right, these highlights, I want them to get warmer. So look at that. So we've gone from there, whoop, there, sorry. I'll make them cooler for sure. But this is only attacking the highlights. It's only attacking the lights. So let's make them warmer, yeah, up into that real red sort of glow, the ready orange glow. Shadows, I'd like them to be cooler. Maybe down to, oh, maybe there. And then the mid-tones, all of this stuff here. Um, well, maybe we make that a little bit cooler too. And look at the difference to the image from there to there. It's subtle and it's split. So instead of having one global change, let's just create a clone of that variant and go to color grade off. So I'm going to compare these two side by side. So here on the right was our one without that grade here on the left is the one with the grade. We can't achieve this one on the left with white balance. The reason being that the white balance is going to shift everything to be warmer or everything to be cooler or everything to be more pink, more green um, if you use tint. With the color balance tool on this one, you can see I'm literally splitting out the different tones in the image to be cooler or warmer or you know more green or more red or whatever based on where they sit in the image. In fact, I kind of like that a bit more. And you can play with this. That's the other thing. When you're doing split toning like this, be careful with skin tones. Um, you don't want you know, weird colors um, from on, on people. It just doesn't make sense. But you can have a bit of color shift because obviously if the light had changed tone, then the reflection from people would change as well. But if I look at these two images, I cannot do on the left or what I did on the left with the white balance on the right. It just doesn't work. You've got to use something like color balance to do it. So that's where I would get to, Ray. Um, from the original image, I'd say that's probably a bit more, feels more intimate, a bit more um, about a bar, sort of close and whatever. Um, but overall, that's that would be the, the shift that I, I did. If you wanted to experiment further, you could actually play with this in black and white. So I'm just going to reduce or remove that color grade um, layer and turn on my black and white tool. Now the reason I'm saying black and white, having just gone through, in fact, it looks like you played with black and white already, which is kind of good. Um, so I'm just going to reset these. Um, the reason that the black and white tool in, in logical terms has a link to color balance is because we're doing very similar things, we're, except we're going the other way. So we're taking a color and we're making it lighter or darker 
depending on where it what, what our slider value is on there so like in the in effectively if you use a filter for a black and white photograph or photograph you, know, you put a red filter on there you, you can cut colors or you can cut wavelengths of light based on the filter that you put in front of the lens we can do that here so i can say anything that was red make it darker please or make it lighter please and then it was yellow make it a bit lighter so we're getting the background up that's separating out these people in the foreground anything that's blue do we want to increase or decrease that i'd actually increase it a little bit the cyan's i'd decrease that gets rid of this guy here the greens not having much of an effect there's not much green in this image magentas maybe a little bit on the hand but each black and white conversion that you do you can tweak all of these different settings in order to get the colors reacting to the the brightness that you choose to separate things out and you can see in here because that background effectively was reds and yellows by making them brighter we've managed to separate out this foreground these people from the background because these people don't sit in the reds and yellows they sit in the blues and the greens and the the, the science so same technique, same sorry, not same technique, same thought process. We're looking at what can we change, whether it's in shadows and highlights or whether it's in colors, to separate and focus in on the subject. But in this one, it's a really simple one to go from the the first image. You know, what have we done? We've created a manual vignette. We've focused in on that person as a result. We've got rid of this out of it. We've removed the distraction of this person. Changed the color balance of the shot, um, the shadows and the highlights, and then. You could play even further <clears throat> and do it with black and white but the most powerful thing you can do with this shot is focus in um, on the person that's supposed to be the the focal point using that exposure but a classic vignette's not going to do it because you lose all of this stuff up here um we will quickly touch on one of georg's images um this one we're going to cover the other one next time i think um but it's, it's just one to, to bear in mind um on this so um, Georg's done a layer on here of sky. In fact, let me just turn these off so you can see quickly. A bit of healing on there, fine. So here's our background, and Georg wanted to make the, the buildings pop. So there's a layer for sky. Great. And then there's a layer to enrich the buildings, which has a mask on the buildings. Great. But look at what it's done here. So what Georg's done is he's put a new layer on called Darken the Shine Through. I like the layer name um, to try and get rid of that glow when actually there was a simpler way of doing this and you don't need that what we needed to do was not include that sky in the buildings layer because this buildings layer lifts everything up including the sky which is already bright behind there and actually the sky layer bearing in mind you've done all this level changing needed to include the sky through the windows so let's just take the building layer and you can see the, the quick version of, of how we do that. We're going to go into Luma range and we are going to exclude anything that is really bright. Now look at what's happening. I'm not just losing the stuff through the window. I'm also losing stuff here. So we've got to be careful with that. So I'm going to go to there. Bit of fall off. Oh, no, we go to there. Okay, hit apply. Now think about what I just did with rasterizing the layer. If I try and paint something now, because it's not in that Luma range, it doesn't matter how many times I paint, it's not going to have any effect whatsoever because it's excluded from the Luma range. So what I'm going to do, right click, rasterize the layer. Now I've got the Luma range I'm happy with. Now I can fill in all the other stuff that the Luma range has excluded. And this is the wonderful part of this because now with our sky, also going through the building windows we've got a more natural look to what we had before so it's really important that you know don't just think about sky as the object of the sky think about sky as the, the literal sky that you're looking through um, in there and also in sky so the same thing would apply in here i could include the building over here so if i um, go to my brush and let's just why am my brush not working so i'm just going to increase the size of my brush quite quickly to include the building i'm going to do this very very roughly but you get the idea because what we're then going to do so we've now included the the 
um, windows through the building, but we've also included the building. Strangely, Luma range. So include all of this stuff, but exclude the dark shell. So all of these dark areas down here. Apply. And now I've got the sky going through. And that just looks more natural, and you don't have to do this extra darkening layer. So I'm hoping, although that's very quick, it makes sense. Don't think about sky. If you've got some stuff that's transparent, you can see the sky through it. So stopping the sky mask at the edge of a building doesn't make sense. We also need to include some of the, the stuff that you see through. To be really pedantic, that amount that you're including through the window should be maybe less than 100% because the window does cut down some of the sky. But I would do it that way with Luma ranges and excluding buildings and structures rather than using the hard line of the building itself. So that's it for today. Um, that's kind of um, where we're at. So yeah, very, very quick, rapid thing. You might have to watch that again, the Luma range thing. Sorry, I'll, I'll describe it, I'm sure, in better detail next time. Um, but there, Ray's um, bar scene, and then, you know, all the stuff that you've just got to be aware of before you start playing with any styles, whether they're created for you or you've created your own. Get that base adjustment right, otherwise things get, get very wrong very quick. So don't forget, um, as I mentioned, we've got Raphael on, on the 2nd of February. Um, so throw in questions, that email address up there. Um, coming up, so that's on the 2nd. Uh, next live editing will be on the 7th of February. So the following week, I think that is. Um, and the next masterclass that we do, um, and I'm not even saying what the title is yet because we're trying to work out with something, um, whether we can do something. But it will be on the 21st of February and we will let people know what that is in a week's time. So have a look out on Facebook and YouTube because those will all be announced on there and have links on there and look in the description of this video if you want to sign up for the Raphael session. Um, if you want to go through any masterclasses which we have already recorded, um, go to the link. Again, there's a lot of links in the description, um, but we've got in there stuff like black and white conversion, but also um, golden hour specifically um, for those that want to have a look at that. Um, but between now and next time, which will be in a month's time, um, look after yourselves. Please upload your images with raw files. So poryforlive.wetransfer.com. Please include your name. You must include your name. Um, so if you don't have a name, we're not going to include your image. Um, but upload any issues you've got or any raw files you want to have a play with. And between then and next month, we'll catch you later. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.